please join me in giving a big town hall welcome to Max Tegmark. Thank you so much. This is such a pleasure to be here. It's a real honor and pleasure to be back here in Seattle again. And uh, I can think of no more fitting place to talk about questions to do with the long-term future of humanity and what we really want it to mean to be human and what sort of future we want to build than in a, in a church. Twenty seconds and counting. T minus fifteen seconds. Guidance is internal. Twelve, eleven, ten, nine. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Thirty-two minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo eleven. So, can someone remind me where this rocket went to? Indeed. This mission was not only successful, but also inspiring. Because it showed us that when we humans manage technology wisely, we can accomplish amazing things that our ancestors could only dream of. So, in this spirit, I want to devote the rest of this talk here to another journey powered by something more powerful than rocket engines where the passengers are not merely three astronauts but all of humanity. So let's talk about our collective journey into the future with artificial intelligence. My friend and colleague Jan Tallinn likes to emphasize that just as with rocketry, it's not enough to just make our technology powerful. We also need to figure out how to control it and where we want to go with it. And those are really key th themes for tonight. 13.8 billion years ago, our universe was very boring. And since then, it's transformed not only from hot to cold, but also from boring to increasingly complex and interesting. And of late, even coming alive, having small parts of it become self-aware and marveling at its beauty and pondering what they want for the future. And in this cosmic perspective, I think it's important to reflect on the fact that still today, on this scale, life is an almost imperceptibly small perturbation on things, on an otherwise dead and, and lifeless universe. But that might change. If we think about the Pacific Northwest, it's been completely transformed by life, right? And if we continue our progress in figuring out through science how our cosmos works, and we use this science to make technology, in particular artificial intelligence, as I argue in my book, there's no reason why life couldn't become a really driving force spreading throughout much of our cosmos in the future, flourishing not just on Earth, but in countless other places for billions of years. So there's a, there's a lot at stake here. There is an enormous upside if we get things right with technology. Now, the first life that arrived here on Earth it was actually really dumb. I call it life 1.0. Couldn't even learn anything in this lifetime. Bacteria have all their software just hard-coded and then it's DNA given to it by evolution. In contrast, life 2.0, which is what I call us, we can learn. And if you uh, look at me through the eyes of a, of a computer geek, then learning means I'm simp I'm uploading new software that gives me new skills. If I decide I want to learn Spanish, I can study Spanish, and then suddenly I have all these abilities, this software that I didn't used to have. And it's this ability for us to learn, to, to um, design our own software, which has enabled cultural evolution, and which has enabled us humans to become the dominant form on this planet. Some think we might be heading 
in the direction of Life 3.0, where we can design not just our software, but also our hardware. We're certainly not there, but maybe we're at 2.1 right now, because we can get artificial kneecaps, cochlear implants, make a few other tweaks to our hardware. But if you were robots who are as intelligent as you are now, there would be no limits whatsoever to how you could upgrade your hardware as well. And life would have then broken fully free from its evolutionary shackles and have, have become the master of its own destiny. Now, with this rocket metaphor, we talked about the power and then controlling it and figuring out where you want to go with it. So let's start by talking just a little bit about the power Sick. of artificial intelligence, which has grown spectacularly in recent years. I'm defining intelligence in the book as simply the ability to accomplish complex goals. And the reason I give such a broad definition is because I really don't like this carbon chauvinism attitude where we say that things can't be intelligent unless they're made of cells or meat or carbon atoms or whatever. So in this broader definition, it will include both biological forms of intelligence and also non-biological forms, which we call artificial intelligence. Much of the recent progress in, in AI has been not in old stuff like pocket calculators where they never learn and just keep performing the same computation every time you press the square root button or whatnot, but rather machine learning systems which can, can learn and improve what they do through data from the environment. And the subset of that that's grown the fastest has been deep learning, a kind of machine learning using neural inspired architectures, neural networks. So if you look at, for example, AI breakthroughs from two decades ago, like when Gary Kasparov, the chess champion, got his posterior kicked by IBM's Deep Blue, the intelligence in this machine was not learned. It was programmed in by humans who know, knew a lot about chess, and the reason it could beat Kasparov was simply because it could think faster and remember more. In contrast, most of the recent stuff that impresses us is learned. So, for example, Google developed a neural network where you just train it on massive amounts of data, and uh, it didn't really know, and then it can take just pictures represented by numbers that tell you what color the different pixels are and spit out the caption saying this is a group of young people playing a game of frisbee. If you instead feed it this image, it says that this is a herd of elephants walking across a grass field. And what's so interesting is nobody had programmed in any information into this neural network about what an elephant is or a frisbee or a field or that there even is such a thing as a three-dimensional space or a world with objects in it. It just learned to perform this particular task. An even more striking example, I think, is um, this one. So can someone remind me what game this is? Yeah, so this was, you can date, you can figure out when I was a kid from the fact that this was modern and cool back then. So what's really interesting about this is this is deep neural network with so-called reinforcement learning, which is gradually learning to play this game. It has no idea what a paddle is, or what a ball is, or what a brick is, or anything. It just tries random things to, to, to maximize its score. And by now, even though it sucked in the beginning, you can see now it catches the ball every time, which is better than I can do on this game. And most amazingly of all, the people who did this at Google DeepMind, they actually had not wasted as much time as I had on this game as a kid, and didn't know that there's this really cool trick where if you Keep, if you eventually drill a hole on the side, look, you could just rake in the point like this. And after the AI had figured this out, look how it just ruthlessly does this. Over and over and over again. <laughs> so you might say, well, this is a very simple little game world, two dimensional and dramatically less complex than the real world, but if you're a robot, then uh, you can think of life itself as a kind of game. So you might ask, what happens if you use this sort of technology to just see how well a machine can get at performing, or an AI, at certain tasks? This is what, exactly what Google DeepMind did this last summer to see if, they could, if, if uh, simulated robots could learn to walk. And this is what happened. And what's interesting here 
is that the no information was put into this about walking or videos of walking or anything. The AI system was just rewarded whenever it managed to, by sending random commands to bend the joints, move forward. And eventually it came up with this. This really begs the question. What are the, how far can, can AI go? How much can, can artificial intelligence actually end up learning of the things that we humans do? I like to think about this in terms of the following image, inspired by, by uh, Hans Moravec. And uh, I've drawn it here so that the height represents how difficult each task is in the landscape of tasks. And the sea level represents how good machines are doing these different tasks. So as you can see, some particular tasks like playing chess or doing arithmetic have long since been submerged by machines that are better than us at it now, whereas others have not. But we have kind of a global warming going on here in this intellectual landscape where the sea level keeps rising, right? So what's gonna happen eventually? Some people think, and some serious AI researchers think that for some reason, the progress in AI will eventually stop and some parts will never be submerged. That there will be some things that we can do that machines can never do. But there are a lot of others, in fact, most AI researchers in recent polls who think that the sea level will never stop and that eventually machines will learn to do everything that we can. The median guess for when this might happen in some recent polls have been maybe decades from now. So. In other words, if you ask people who work on AI when AI will sur surpass human abilities on all tasks, some people are up here in the techno-skeptic camp and think either never or too far into the future for us to need to talk about it now, which means there's no point in worrying about how we should steer the development of AI because it doesn't matter yet. Most people are sort of down here. But some of those researchers also think there's no point in talking about steering, either because they're convinced that things are going to end up awesome, I call them digital utopians, or because they're convinced that things are going to suck, so it doesn't matter what we do. But actually, most AI researchers are falling in this camp here in the middle, where they think what's going to happen really depends a lot on what we do now and how we, how we plan and how we steer the whole development. Which is, this is the place where it's maximally motivating to try to do things about this. We, I launched a, a survey of this with my, some of my colleagues on the site ageofai.org where you can go and say what you think. And I, last weekend I just analyzed the first 14,886 responses and it's actually fascinating to see that the general public get, makes exactly the same kind of guesses as the AI experts. Some people think not never gonna happen. Some people think it's definitely gonna be awesome. Some people think it's definitely gonna suck. But most people are here thinking, yeah, it's pretty plausible it'll happen, maybe in decades or so, and it could be good or bad. So then that makes it very interesting to ask, what useful things can we do now to steer this in a good direction? Which is the perfect segue into this question of steering our technology, controlling it. So to help with this, together with some co-conspirators here, we founded the Future of Life Institute. And I'm very fortunate that two of my co-conspirators are actually here. So Tucker Davey and Mayakita Tegmark. Do you want to just stand up for a moment so people can see? There they are. Tucker <laughs> is actually, in addition to being an awesome colleague, he has shown the great wisdom recently of moving to Seattle. <laughs> Yay. And you can see we have the, the, even the word steer here right in our mission statement. Our goal is we want the future of life to exist and be as awesome as possible. And we're interested in how can we, how can we steer our technology so that this happens. I'm optimistic that we can create a very inspiring future with technology, including AI, as long as we win this race between the growing power of the technology and the growing wisdom with which we manage our technology. But that's an important if. When we invented fire, for example, we screwed up a bunch of times and then we invented the fire extinguisher. With cars, we screwed up a bunch of times and then we invented the seatbelt, the airbag and the traffic light and so on. And for all 
less powerful technologies. This strategy of learning from mistakes is how we ended up making sure wisdom stayed ahead. Okay, but when technology gets more and more powerful, which of course it is as time progresses, at some point we reach a stage, a threshold beyond which we don't want to learn from mistakes anymore. I would argue that with nuclear weapons, and certainly with, with super intelligence, learning from mistakes is a really bad idea. You don't want to be like, oopsie, we started World War III, but uh, let's see what we can learn from this. Uh, much better to think through the risks, plan ahead, and avoid them and get things right the first time, because it might be the only time we'll have. Some people tell me, Max, no, 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 don't talk about risks with technology, because that's just Luddite scaremongering. I don't think it's Luddite scaremongering. I think it's just safety engineering. When NASA thought through very carefully all the things that could have gone wrong with the Apollo 11 mission, and believe me, there are a lot of things that can go wrong when you put three people on top of a 100 meter tall rocket full of highly flammable rocket fuel, right, uh, and send them into space. That wasn't Luddite scaremongering. That was exactly the safety engineering that resulted in the mission's success. And that's exactly what I think we need to do with, with powerful technologies like AI. I think that uh, we have, it's, not, we, it's pretty clear though that we haven't really absorbed this message yet, that our tech is getting so powerful that we have to switch from learning from mistakes to safety engineering. Nuclear weapons illustrate that. So yesterday, for example, was that, was that a great famous anniversary of something that you know of? Well, it came pretty close to being the anniversary, perhaps, of, of World War III, the 34th anniversary, to be precise, because this guy, Stanislav Petrov, was in charge of a Soviet early warning system which showed that the U.S. had just launched five-minute man nuclear missiles at them. And fortunately for us here tonight in, in Seattle, he decided, just based on gut instinct, that there was something fishy about this and didn't escalate this in the Soviet didn't launch their entire nuclear arsenal at, us at, at that time. But I don't think we want to keep relying on this kind of luck in the long term. So, so what can we do to, uh, to win this wisdom race and stay ahead of the game? We've put a lot of energy with the Future Life Institute into trying to engage AI researchers in this discussion. We organized a conference in Puerto Rico in 2015, and then in the beginning of this year, we organized a conference in uh, Asilomar, California, where we were very honored to have 150 people, including many of the leading AI researchers, both CEOs of companies doing AI and many of the leading academics and also a lot of other great thinkers. And a key output from this process was the 23 Asilomar AI principles, which were intended as helpful guides to, to wisdom that we want to try to develop here. So I wanted to spend a little bit of time unpacking some of the core messages from this. So first of all, the whole goal of AI research, people felt, should be redefined from just building powerful technology because it's cool to building beneficial intelligence so that it's actually, the steering is sort of part of the, of the project. I mean, you live here in Seattle where once upon a time the Tacoma Narrows Bridge fell down, right? If you're a civil engineer, building bridges that don't fall down is just part of your job. You don't first study civil engineering and then you take a special ethics class to build like ethical bridges. It's just part of, <laughs> part of, your, part of the very <laughs> goal of, of civil engineering to build things that work. And, and similarly, people here in the AVI community feel that making AI systems that actually do good things should just be part of, of the very goal itself. Now, then it says research funding here. So there are a lot of tough technical challenges, tough questions we need to answer. For example, raise your hand if your computer has ever crashed. <laughs> I had a, a very sobering conversation right before this here with, with a, a cybersecurity expert who told me all sorts of horrifying things <laughs> about them. Um, Equifax breach and other things. And, and clearly, you know, before we entrust computers ever more with 
taking with operating our infrastructure and weapon systems and so on and we really need to tr figure out how to transform today's buggy and hackable computers into robust AI systems that we can really trust, right? For example, if things can get hacked, then all the wonderful technology we build can, can be just be turned against us. So that's those are examples of hard questions in AI, AI safety research, and I'll talk about additional questions later. And there's, I'm very happy that the AI community has really joined this whole discussion very vigorously and engaged with it. And there are so many researchers out there who want to do this kind of research, but they have right now have almost no funding for it. So it's very important that governments around the world view funding AI research as AI safety research as just an integral part of computer science funding. Just like you would never fund nuclear reactor research without funding nuclear reactor safety research. A second principle I want to highlight here is number 15. It says that the economic prosperity created by AI should be shared broadly to benefit all of humanity. What's that all about? Well, of course, technology has greatly grown the economic pie in America over the decades. But as you're also well aware, that growth hasn't been spread evenly. In fact, if you look at the bottom 90% of income earners in the U.S., they also started getting wealthier and wealthier until about when I was born. So, and after that, their income really hasn't particularly grown at all. Maybe it was my fault, but uh, a lot of economists think that this is very linked to automation, replacing higher payer, paying jobs by lower paying jobs. And um, some people say, well, don't worry about this. There's going to be a big change soon when all sorts of new jobs that don't exist yet are going to change this and these people are going to get much better off again. But actually, if you look at the data, it really doesn't support that conclusion at all. Because you could have made the same argument 100 years ago when, all sorts of, when lots of farm jobs were being automated by tractors and combines and so on. You could have argued that those jobs will be replaced by new jobs that didn't exist in 1917. But did that actually happen? Well, let's look. These are the most common jobs in the U.S. today, sorted by size in a giant pie chart here. And you can start reading down from the top. Managers, drivers, retail salespeople, cashiers, cooks, waiters, etc. It's only when you get to 21st place that you get to a kind of job that didn't exist in 1917. So, and that job, which is software developers, employs only this tiny sliver of all people. So what actually happened was actually quite different. What actually happened was that people who were automated out of farming and earlier on automated in industri out of their jobs by the Industrial Revolution, they switched from jobs where they were earning a living using their muscles to jobs where they, by educating themselves more, could instead earn a living using their brain. Okay? And those were largely jobs that already had existed before. And uh, in this case, it turned out to be generally a good thing because those brain jobs paid more than the muscle jobs. So everybody, so people got better off. But this time is different because right now what we're seeing is a lot of middle class jobs where people use their brains are being automated away by AI. And these people then are being switched into other jobs where they typically pay less. If you look at not the bottom 90%, but the bottom 30% of income earners in America, they're and actual inflation adjusted incomes have actually gone down a lot in recent decades, which, is, which has created a really growing anger and bitterness, which has given us Donald Trump, which has given us Brexit, and giving us, given us an increasingly polarized society. So what the AI community is saying with a very united voice here is that, you know, if we cannot figure out a way to take all this fantastic growth and wealth that's being produced can be produced by technology by AI new services and new product and figure out a way to share it well enough that everybody gets better off and shame on us then I want to switch to just mention briefly principle 18 here saying that an arms race and lethal autonomous weapons should be avoided what are they, what are, what's that all about? This is not about drones, 
which are remote controlled weapons where a human is still there making the decision who to kill. Instead, auto lethal and autonomous weapons are completely automatic AI systems where the, where the machine itself makes the decision about who to kill and then goes ahead and, ma and kills that person with no human in the loop whatsoever. Okay? And this is not something which is some sort of far out science fiction like thing or something that requires superhuman intelligence. This is really technology that we almost have now. And the question is, do we want an arms race where these kind of anonymous murder machines get, get so cheap that everybody with an axe to grind can buy them? And uh, the reason for uh, significant concern is that although most of the AI that's been invented so far has been invented in the civilian sector, in universities and by private companies, and, and there's tons of money invested in civilian companies now, the military here and elsewhere is starting to invest more. And we're getting budgets that look like this. So that the loud sucking noise we hear at places like MIT and UW here, where people try to recruit the bright new AI graduates, will come increasingly from the military. And um, the AI community does not want AI to become primarily a new way of harming people, but rather providing new ways of helping people. Any, any science can be used mainly to harm people or to help people. And there's reason for hope here because biologists, for example, they uh, really, really advocated very successfully as a community that biology should be used to help people and managed to actually push for there being a ban on biological weapons. As a result of which today, if you ask people what they associate with biology, they're much more likely to say new cures than biological weapons, right? Similarly, if you ask people what they mainly associate chemistry with today, they're much more likely to say new materials than bioweapons. And even though there has been a lot of cheating on those treaties on bioweapons and chemical weapons, they have been incredibly successful in stigmatizing these weapons. Most people feel that these are just disgusting weapons. And the stigma is so strong that even people who have cheated, for example, like Assad in Syria, actually gave up the chemical weapons because they were so stigmatized in order to not get invaded. And the AI community is very much hoping that it's going to be the same with, um, with, with uh, AI weapons and that AI can go down in history as, as, as basically new, mainly new ways of helping people. This is not just some sort of long-term pie-in-the-sky stuff. Again, I want to emphasize there is a, there are meet, there's a meeting at the United Nations in November, in just two months, to discuss whether to start negotiating an international treaty to try to limit lethal Thomas weapons. Finally, turning to more long-term issues here, you'll see, first of all, that the, it talks here about existential risks superintelligence, the recursive self-improvement, and so on, which are words that if you said them a few years ago, a lot of people would just totally dismiss you as being a Luddite who had no clue what you were talking about and obviously didn't know anything about AI. And yet, these principles are signed here by over a thousand AI researchers, including Demis Asabis, the founder and CEO of Google DeepMind, arguably the leading AI company in the world, Jan LeCun from Facebook, Jeff Dean from Google Brain, and, and really a who's who of, of leaders in AI. So what's happened? How have these concerns become more mainstream? What's the logic that's led people to sort of take this seriously? Let's unpack this a little bit. So super intelligence, first of all, refers to intelligence that's not just a little bit smarter than us, but actually way better than us at, at everything. Why would we, anyone in the right mind, think that something like that might happen? Even if you, even if you assume that maybe we'll get machines that can do everything we can in a few decades, why would all of a sudden you get, go from there to machines that are like way, way better than us? Wouldn't that take you know, tens of thousands of years or whatnot? Well, actually, maybe not. There's this very simple argument which is summarized by just this one paragraph from Irving J. Good two years before I was born, which basically points out that if you can make a machine that can do everything that humans can just as well, then that includes 
making AI systems, because that's something we can do. So then in, instead of hiring 40,000 people at Microsoft or at Google you know, to do this, why not just use 40 million pieces of software, for example, to do this stuff much faster? So this would mean that instead of, the t the, instead of being developed on sort of human, typical human R&D cycles of like years, for each big improvement, or whatever, the, uh, the, the time scale would now be set instead by how fast machines can do the research, right? Which can be scaled up dramatically. And it could go much, much faster. In fact, in my book, in the opening, you'll, you'll see an example of how this might happen very fast and what that could lead to. And then, of course, these improved machines could in turn develop even, help to be used to develop even better machines and better machines. And you, you could end up with a situation which it's been called an intelligence explosion, where before long, machines would be just dramatically beyond us in, in capability. These people who sign this are not saying that this is going to happen. They're just saying this is, this is a possibility we should take seriously and need to plan for accordingly. Think about, really think hard about whether we want or not. And if we want it, then think through the pitfalls. It also says existential risk here which refers to risks, for example, that could just drive humanity extinct altogether. Why would you take that seriously? I, I roll my eyes and feel so terrible if I'm forced to watch The Terminator because it's just so absolutely silly and unrealistic, these sort of, these sort of horror flicks. And, and why, so why would anyone in their right mind think that it could be a threat to have highly intelligent machines? For, first of all, it's important to remember that intelligence can give power. Right? We humans are much more, have much more power on this planet than tigers, not because we have bigger muscles and sharper claws, but because we're smarter, right? So if we create machines that are much smarter than us, there is the possibility that, for, uh, that other humans could use them to take power over us. And there's also a possibility that those machines themselves might take power over us. But why would, they, why would they have anything against us? Especially, wouldn't they be just be grateful that we built them? Or couldn't we just pull, unplug them or something? Well, Terminator and movies like that make us worry about altogether the wrong thing. They, worry, they make us worry about somehow machines being evil and deliberately having the goal just to harm us. But actually, the, it, isn't, doesn't it sound silly that, that we should worry about machines having goals of harming us or having that machines might have typical s silly alpha male traits like hogging resources and defending themselves if we are the ones who program the goals into them? You know, why should we worry about that? There is actually a very simple reason for why you might worry about that. And I'm going to illustrate that by just this very silly little uh, computer game <laughs> I made up for the purpose of this. Where you have, so just imagine that you're this very friendly little blue robot, okay, but very smart, and your only goal is to save as many sheep as you can from the big bad wolf. You don't care about dying or, any, or getting rich, you just love these cute little sheepies and want to help them, okay? But you're smart, so you think a little bit, and then you realize that if you run into the bomb here and get destroyed, you're not going to save any sheep at all. So, you develop a self-preservation instinct, right? And you can immediately see that this argument is very general. If you have a future very intelligent robot, then you tell it to uh, go down to the supermarket and buy you some good food and fix up a nice Italian dinner for you. And then on the way back, the robot encounters a mugger who tries to destroy it. The robot is going to realize that even if it, though it's not afraid of dying, if it gets destroyed, you're not going to get your Italian dinner. And that's its only goal. It wants to cook you that dinner, right? So it's going to defend itself or try to find a way of avoiding getting destroyed. It just follows from the goal you gave it, the sub-goal of, of self-preservation. What about acquiring resources? Well, this robot will also have an incentive to understand its, its world better, how it works. And if it discovers that this potion here can make it run twice as fast, then it's going to want to acquire that resource because then it has time to save more of these cute little sheep before the wolf eats them. 
and if it discovers that there's a gun there, it's going to have an incentive to acquire that resource so it can shoot the wolf and save all the sheep. N not because it wants resources per se, but because it really wants to save sheep and having those resources help. If you have a very advanced computer in the future that you've programmed to really help Seattle as much as possible, and that's the only goal you've given it, it would also have an incentive to acquire more resources so it can compute better and help Seattle better. And what if it decides to take those resources from, from Tacoma or something, right? <laughs> so then you might have inadvertently given it a sub-goal that you didn't want. And therein lies the rub. It really, it's really crucial that we align, if we create machines that are very smart, that we make sure that their goals are aligned with ours. It doesn't have to be a bad thing to be in the presence of other intelligent beings that are smarter than us. In fact, we've already been there. All of us have been in the presence of beings that were smarter than us when we were about this big. They were our parents, right? And the reason that was okay was because their goals were aligned with our goals. So in summary, almost whatever ultimate goal you give to a very, very intelligent entity, if it's open-ended, the goal, it will, it will tend to lead to these sub-goals, like get, get better hardware, better software, acquire resources, and so on. And that means we have to be a little bit careful. So in other words, when I said earlier that people really want to support more AI safety research, it doesn't only include short-term challenges like making machines not buggy and not hackable, there are also questions about how you can make machines, for example, understand our goals, learn our goals, and, and retain our goals. And I want to show you just a very brief video about superintelligence that, that elaborates on these challenges a little bit more. Will artificial intelligence ever replace humans? Is a hotly debated question these days. Some people claim computers will eventually gain super intelligence, be able to outperform humans on any task, and destroy humanity. Other people say, don't worry, AI will just be another tool we can use and control, like our current computers. So we've got physicist and AI researcher Max Tegmark back again to share with us the collective takeaways from the recent Asilomar conference on the future of AI that he helped organize. And he's going to help separate AI myths from AI facts. Hello. First off, Max, machines including computers have long been better than us at many tasks like arithmetic or weaving, but those are often repetitive and mechanical operations. So why shouldn't I believe that there are some things that are simply impossible for machines to do as well as people? Say, making minute physics videos or consoling a friend. Well, we've traditionally thought of intelligence as something mysterious that can only exist in biological organisms, especially humans. But from the perspective of modern physical science, intelligence is simply a particular kind of information processing and reacting, performed by a particular arrangement of elementary parts particles moving around, and there's no law of physics that says it's impossible to do that kind of information processing better than humans already do. It's not a stretch to say that earthworms process information better than rocks, and humans better than earthworms, and in many areas, machines are already better than humans. This suggests that we've likely only seen the tip of the intelligence iceberg, and that we're on track to unlock the full intelligence that's latent in nature and use it to help humanity flourish, or flounder. So how do we keep ourselves on the right side of the flourish or flounder balance? What, if anything, should we really be concerned about with superintelligent AI? Here is what has many top AI researchers concerned. Not machines or computers turning evil, but something more subtle. Superintelligence that simply doesn't share our goals. If a heat-seeking missile is homing in on you, you probably wouldn't think, no need to worry, it's not evil, it's just following its programming. No, what matters to you is what the heat-seeking missile does, and how well it does it. Not what it's feeling, or whether it has feelings at all. The real worry isn't malevolence, but competence. Superintelligent AI is by definition very good at attaining its goals, so the most important thing for us to do is to ensure that its goals are aligned with ours. As an analogy, humans are more intelligent and competent than ants, and if we want to build a hydroelectric dam where there happens to be an ant hill, there may be no malevolence involved, but well, too bad for the ants. Cats and dogs, on the other hand, have done a great job of aligning their goals with the goals of humans. I mean, even though I'm a physicist, I can't help think kittens are the cutest particle arrangements in our universe. If we build superintelligence, we'd be better off in the position of cats and dogs than ants. Or better yet, we'll figure out how to ensure that AI adopts our goals rather than the other way around. 
And when exactly is superintelligence going to arrive? When do we need to start panicking? First of all, Henry, superintelligence doesn't have to be something negative. In fact, if we get it right, AI might become the best thing ever to happen to humanity. Everything I love about civilization is the product of intelligence. So if AI amplifies our collective intelligence enough to solve today's and tomorrow's greatest problems, humanity might flourish like never before. Second, most AI researchers think superintelligence is at least decades away, but the research needed to ensure that it remains beneficial to humanity rather than harmful might also take decades. So we need to start right away. For example, we'll need to figure out how to ensure machines learn the collective goals of humanity, adopt these goals for themselves, and retain the goals as they get ever smarter. And what about when our goals disagree? Should we vote on what the machine's goals should be? Should we do whatever the president wants? Whatever the creator of the superintelligence wants? Let the AI decide? In a very real way, the question of how to live with superintelligence is a question of what sort of future we want to create for humanity, which obviously shouldn't just be left to AI researchers, as caring and, and socially skilled as we are. So, to summarize, things we should absolutely do, I feel, to win this wisdom race and create a positive future with, with AI is not only ensure that the wealth created by it really makes everybody better off and doesn't that the technology doesn't get perverted into mainly new ways of killing each other in a pointless race to the bottom uh, arms race and invest in AI safety research of all sorts. But we should also think really hard about what sort of future we want. How do we actually want to steer this rocket? Where do we want it to take us? So let me say a few more words about this. In the book, you'll find that uh, I talk quite a lot about goals and possible futures, but I don't say what you should want because that's something that only you can figure out. And I would really encourage you all to, to ask these questions over, di over beers or after, in after dinner parties with your friends. What sort of future are you, are you, would you actually be excited about with or, or, or without technology? And to satisfy our curiosity, those of us at the Future Life Institute, we launched a little survey, which you can take yourself also, at uh, ageofai.org. And uh, looking at the first 14,000 something uh, responses, I was quite interested to find, first of all, that most of the respondents here actually, they want super intelligence, although many aren't sure, and, and some are pretty sure they don't want it. In terms of who should be controlled, in control of society, once there is superintelligence, a lot of people said humans, even more said humans and machines together. <laughs> but I was also amused to see that there was a, a block here of people who said, nah, only machines. <laughs> Don't trust those humans. When, uh, when we asked uh, what, if they wanted machines to be conscious or not, then some people said, yeah, sure, so that they too can enjoy having positive experiences and, and so on. But there was also a, a big chunk of people who said, no, no, we prefer having our helper robots and so on just be unconscious zombies so we don't have to feel guilty about how we treat them. In terms of what sort of a future, so what sort of goals a high-tech future should strive for, a lot of people felt, and this is a very appropriate question to talk, to talk about in a church, that one should try to maximize positive experiences or minimize suffering. See, the questions are all written in a broad way so they, they could in principle apply also to the conscious machines. Uh, some people felt that we should just let future intelligent beings do absolutely whatever we, what they wanted, even if it was something that we realized was just pointlessly banal, like turn the whole universe into paper clips. But, but most people actually felt, no, that since we are actually the ones who are creating this technology, if we, if we choose to do so, we should have a vote also as to what happens in, in the future. The one question that there was the broadest agreement on of all was this one, where almost nobody felt that we should deliberately confine life forever to only exist here on this planet, and that we should, if, we should allow for the possibility that life could spread to more of, this, uh, of our cosmos as well. In the fifth chapter of the book, I explore a wide variety of, of, soci of societies that one might create or might have with, with 
or without superintelligence. And uh, here you can see there is total disagreement about what people prefer. And uh, very, very curious, again, what, what you actually would, would prefer for, for our future. So to summarize, as I said in the beginning, our universe itself has only just barely woken up a little bit. It seems like only a very small part of it is alive and, and conscious so far. Yet, I think this is something very beautiful and worth celebrating, that there, uh, that there is life at all. I think galaxies are very beautiful. But why are they beautiful? It's because we look at them with our telescopes. We subjectively, consciously experience them. That's why they're beautiful. So I feel that it's not us, it's not our universe giving meaning to us. It's us giving meaning to our universe. And if we should screw up with our technology and go extinct, and there's no one else around with telescopes, then these galaxies won't be beautiful anymore. And our whole universe has just gone back to being just a pointless waste of space, which I really feel would be an opportunity lost. And I, feel, I actually feel we have a moral obligation to not squander this incredible gift that we have. And if we do this right instead, and are really good stewards of our technology, and not only develop it and make it powerful, but also put in the care and thought and hard work to make sure that it's beneficial, there are just incredible opportunities for life to flourish for billions of years, not just on Earth, but throughout much of our cosmos. Thank you. So I very much Thank you so much. So I want to remind folks to come on down, line up uh, along the wall here if you want to ask a question. We have about 15 or 20 minutes for questions. I guess I will take curator's prerogative and kick it off while people are coming and lining up. So I, one thing that really struck me was that beautiful map of sort of human knowledge that had the different peaks that AI, the ocean of AI was rising towards. And I noticed that one of the peaks was science, like the highest peak of the mountain was science. But that struck me as maybe wrong because a lot of research in science, particularly things like physics, is very quantitative. And I could imagine like an MIT AI professor of cosmology maybe sooner than I might imagine an AI uh, poet or novelist. And I'm wondering what your opinion is about the application, sort of m near and medium term applications in like research science, research mathematics, things like that, and whether you think you'll be able to understand the papers that the super intelligent a professor AI publishes. Great question. So, so first of all, I absolutely did not mean to imply that it's harder to do science than to do art. It might be that this peak is, is, is much higher. I just wanted to illustrate that these are things that machines are nowhere near being able to do well now. Um, on, on, in terms of helping us do science, I think I feel very optimistic that AI can help quite a lot, even before it can write papers that we don't understand. I mean, think about even science today, or if you look at all the latest breakthroughs in anything from medicine to the cosmology, you know, how, how many of those would just not have been possible without today's computers? The ability to, pro to, to, like, to process massive amounts of data and so on, you know, even, even like, like the work that you kindly mentioned in the introduction where we had worked on making the biggest three-dimensional map of our universe to date and used that to try to figure out the age of our cosmos and stuff about its origin. You know, we had pictures there of hundreds of millions of galaxies. Suppose I had given them, I didn't have a computer, but just give them to a grad student and say, okay, I look at all of these and analyze them and let me know when you're done. <laughs> By the time that student was done, <laughs> I would, if they took vitamins and you know, could live for billions of years, you know, your universe would have changed a lot by then already. So, so if even today, this computers has enabled science to get so much farther, I think there's an incredible potential, even in the very near term, with AI helping, helping propel science forward. So I see a long line here. So let me just remind you all then to try to keep your questions brief and to make sure that they actually are questions. Okay, try to keep it brief. So you talked about this wonderful boom which has been represented by deep learning and the power to build machines that learn. Um, and through these certain deep neural architectures. And so that is really wonderful and we can see what it's created, but a lot of these, you know, even the most 
top of the line Google models. They work because of they have hundreds of computers that can train for weeks. And if you play with these models on your own, they're impressive, but not that impressive. So do you think that to make this next leap towards these, you know, global warming and the rising waters on your diagram, can it be accomplished by just throwing more computing power at the models we have, or do we need another sort of breakthrough? I think we need more breakthroughs, actually. It's a very astute question. First of all, when you train a deep neural network to get very good at telling cats and dogs apart, etc., you need to give it lots of data, right? If you take a human child who's never seen a cat, you only have to show them one and they can already recognize other cats. So we have additional ways of doing things. There are interesting th attempts to try to figure out what that is and, and improve machine learning with it. But I think more fundamentally, today's deep learning software that recognizes images doesn't actually understand much of them, about them at all. It doesn't understand what a cat fundamentally is. Whereas you all have a world model in your head where cats fit in as part of it. And I, I think a key, a key breakthrough that we're still waiting for is to really unify the recent breakthroughs in, in deep learning with the more traditional logic-based approaches to AI where you have a model of the world and you can reason about it. The parts of our brain that we can emulate best with, with AI right now are sort of low-level input, like the visual system, input the visual system and the final sort of output, but the stuff in the middle, you know, where we have high-level discussions and reason about things, that's where we're very much stuck. And so I think, I think we, need, we certainly need breakthroughs like this, unifying a lot of different things. And, um, but, and then and a second thing I think is worth mentioning also about what you brought up about deep learning. Not only doesn't it seem like this alone is going to get us all the way to flood all this, but it's also something which has a lot of challenges in terms of AI safety. Because if you train a neural network that can do all sorts of cool stuff, and you have no idea how it works, it can be very frustrating. You know, suppose I get sentenced to 10 years in jail by a robo judge in the future, it's a, and I ask why, and it says, I was trained by 14 gigabytes of data, and this is my decision, and it is final. Uh, it, it wouldn't feel so great, right? And um, people have already found that you can, the so-called adversarial training, fool vision systems into thinking that a school bus is a camel or a full uh, vision system for a car into thinking that pedestrians are just not there. And uh, before we put AI in charge of ever more of our infrastructure and so on, we have to make sure that we understand it well enough that, that these sort of things can't happen. So this is, I think, a key tech challenge. My group at MIT is actually working very hard on what I like to call intelligible intelligence, where you make things that aren't just capable, but where you can actually understand what they're doing. Only then do I feel we'll be able to start getting some trust in them. Thank you. So, is there AI that is helping individuals becoming their best selves, as defined by individuals? Streamline survival, health, enough wealth, and so on, and then develop thriving pers personal growth. Very, very interesting question. Um, ultimately, uh, Technology is a tool, right? Which tends to be a double-edged sword. Sometimes people ask me, are you for AI or against AI? And I, I usually reply by asking them if they're for fire or against fire. You can, I'm, of, and of course, you guys are probably for using fire to keep your homes warm in the winter and against using it for arson. And with the tools that AI is giving, giving us today, you all have an individual choice to how you want to use it. If you want to use it, as in your question, to fulfill your dreams and become the person you want to be, or whether you just want to let this technology own you, you know, and become the person who is unable to have a conversation for five minutes without interrupting it by checking your phone, right? So I encourage you all to think about this. What sort of person, relationship do you want to have with technology? And then try to make it so. Hi, thanks for coming out tonight. I've been dying to ask you a question about our mathematical universe, so I hope you don't mind. It's slightly off topic. Um, Maybe actually what we should do, since there's a long line, is if you come up to me afterwards at the book signing, I, I, I'd love to talk with you about physics and cosmology, okay? Okay. okay. Great, I'll be here. Sure. You know good. where to find me. 
Hi, I hope I have a shorter question. My name is Doug. I'm the head coach of the Seattle Canoe and Kayak Club. I'm also the annoying guy who yelled out, go AI, go, when I was inspired by the obvious learning of the machine under its own agency. I had that same reaction yesterday when I was teaching some young people how to race Olympic canoes and kayaks. But what I'm wondering is, when you are out lecturing and working with groups of people and individuals, do we really understand the difference between machine learning on its own and programmed computers? Or do we really get it when we, un when we see that example of the video game where you're saying, here's 200 lessons, here's 400 lessons, here's 600 lessons, and the machine got it on its own? It wasn't programmed to do that. Do we understand what we're getting into? What would you say to that question? No. <laughs> yeah, I, I think, uh, so I'm glad you, you, you really responded to seeing that video to, to drive home the fact that it's, this is real. You know, machines can, can learn. And uh, that's precisely the reason why it, it's not at all science fiction to imagine that machines can get way, way better than us. People can also get better than their teachers, right? Our children often get much better at us, at things than we are. Why is it? Because they ultimately start learning for themselves, right? And um, the, uh, this, this poses additional challenges to create a good future. So I mentioned earlier, right, this, this technical challenge. It's okay that we really need to make sure if we have really smart machines that align their goals with ours, how do we accomplish that? Well, first we need to make them understand our goals and then adopt them and then retain them as they get smarter. And if, if you tell your future self-driving car to take you to SeaTac Airport as fast as possible and you get there covered in vomit and chased by helicopters and you're like, no, 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 that's not what I asked for. And it that responds, that's exactly what you asked for. Right? Then you have appreciated how hard it is to get a machine, first of all, to really understand your goals, right? And raise your hand if you have children. So, do you know how big the difference is between having your children understand what you want and actually adopting those goals and doing what you want, right? That can be very challenging with the machines also. We have, with children, fortunately, they, they smarten up rather slowly. When they're six months old, you can't explain your high-level goals because they're not smart enough to get it yet. But they spend a lot of time in this age where they're roughly as smart as you are and also are still much pliable still, so you can hope to instill your goals in them. But if a machine smartens up much, much faster, it might blow through that magic window where it'll adopt your, we can persuade it to adopt your goals too fast. That's a challenge. And third, how do you make sure machines retain their goals? Suppose we succeed in, in creating friendly AI that has its, its really, ex, really has its goal of, of helping humanity flourish. But, and then it gets much smarter after that. You know, my kids were really, really excited about playing with Legos when they were little. Now that they're teenagers, you know, not so much. And we want to make sure then that these machines don't eventually get as bored with this childhood goal of being nice to humanity as my kids are, you know, with Legos. So there are a lot of challenges we have there. And uh, when I talk about AI safety research, it, it absolutely involves also solving these problems that we, they might take decades to solve. So we should start the research now not the night before someone switches on a superintelligence. Um, so this question is about that uh, survey response that you recorded about whether people wanted their AIs and robots to be conscious or to be zombies. Um, so something I haven't been able to sort out is, you know, once we get to the point where AIs are good enough to pass the Turing test with flying colors, um, how will we know whether they're conscious or whether they're zombies? Oh, that's a wonderful, wonderful question. The whole eighth chapter of my book is actually about consciousness, yeah. which tells you how fascinated I am about this question. So let me tell you, first of all, that uh, a lot of, of very well-known scientists and thinkers think all talk of consciousness is just unscientific BS. Daniel Dennett, for example, says consciousness is illusion. If you go look up the Macmillan Dictionary of Psychology, here's what it says. <laughs> Nothing worth reading has ever has been written on it, right? 
But I respectfully disagree. I feel that uh, int intelligence is not logically the same thing as consciousness, what, which, which I simply define as a subjective experience, right? So, you, so we are taking in information from our senses and then processing it somehow and then sending out commands to our actuators or muscles, right? And David Chalmers, the famous philosopher, likes to call all of these the easy problems. They're, in my mind, really problems of intelligence. And you can convince yourself that you've solved them if you can build machines that can do all those things too, right? Whereas if, you, if you're driving a car, you're experiencing colors and sounds and vibrations and emotions. Does a self-driving car experience anything? Does it feel like anything to be a self-driving car? That's what he calls the hard problem. And I feel this is not BS. I feel this is a real scientific question that we, that we should ask. And, and just in case... Uh, there probably are a number of you in the audience who've sort of defaulted to figuring this is just uh, pseudo-scientific BS. Let me try to persuade you that this is actually a legit science question that we don't have the answer to and we should be humble about that. Look at this. I'm showing you here color of, of wavelength 450. I'm showing you light of wavelength 450 nanometers and 650 nanometers. And the, the question that we can't answer with science today is, why do you experience it like this, not like this? Why do you experience it like this and not like this? I, will, I claim that this, there is no answer, this, has, this is not simply answered by any, no, any physics that we understand well today. And uh, if you look a little bit more in detail at neuroscience, it just sharpens the mystery. It doesn't dissolve it. We know that uh, when you see light of 450 nanometer wavelength, it tends to activate one of the three kinds of cone receptors in the back of our eyeball here in the retina, whereas the longer wavelength light tends to activate another one of those three, which in turn activate it's a bunch of neurons, especially in the visual cortex of your brain, right? Uh, and we also know that the experience you have subjectively of, of, of colors actually it doesn't even require light. The experience is created back here. We know that because you can experience colors when you're dreaming, when there is absolutely no light and nothing going on in your retina, right? So I, I think, personally, the consciousness is the way information feels when being processed in certain complex ways. And I think we scientists should be honest about the fact that we still really don't know what those complex ways are. Maybe one day we'll discover some principles or some equations that the information processing needs to obey, to be conscious. And if we can do that, that'll be wonderful. First of all, emergency room doctors would love to have a consciousness scanner where they can figure out whether this unresponsive patient who just came in is actually conscious with locked-in syndrome or whether there's someone home there. And, 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 and then we would love to be able to apply, if we have a theory that can predict what's conscious and what not, figure out whether mach which machines are conscious and which aren't. And l a lot of people think, oh no, you know, it's impossible to test these kind of things. Scientifically, I claim it's not. I go into this in great length in the book, but in short, you know, we, we, I can put you in our magnetoencephalography scanner at MIT right now, and with 600 and 306 superconducting um, magnetometers measure the magnetic field around your head and predict with maybe 80% accuracy, which of 50 different things you're thinking about. So you can start to read out information in your own brain into a computer. If, if you have a theory of, that, that predicts which kind of information processing is conscious and which isn't, you could program that into a computer and, it should, and while you sit there and you look, the computer tells you, oh, right now you're thinking about a red apple. You're like, yeah, I am actually theory passed that test. And then, then maybe it predicts that right now I see information, it sees information about your heart rate in your brain and it predicts you're aware of that. And you're like, nope, I was not conscious of that. That was unconscious information. E theory ruled out, goes in the garbage bin of history. That meant there was a scientific theory, right? So I'm actually hopeful that we can do science with this, with this kind of experiments. And if we can ever find a theory that tells you what kind of information processing is conscious, it's really, really important. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you upload yourself into a robot, into some sort of 
more long-lasting body in the future that looks exactly like you and talks like you. And then you feel, ah, I don't mind now my biological body dying because I'm like living on. Wouldn't it be a bummer if, if it turned out that that thing was just a zombie that didn't have any experience at all? Then you would have just subjectively died, right? And the biggest bummer of all would be if, if in the future life spreads throughout the cosmos and does all these wonderful things and we feel like as a civilization, we're proud parents of these future light forms doing all these great things. What if it turns out that they're all just zombies, not conscious, and the whole thing is just a play for empty benches, and our universe just became a giant waste of space? That would be a big bummer. So I, I think this is a fascinating question. I think it's a scientific question, and I think we should be, we shouldn't be, we should try to crack it. All right. Uh, I was interested in your discussion about goals and the relationship to ethical behavior, basically. Um, and you had a hierarchy of goals that started from like one main goal and then a bunch of others came from it, or um, a sort of ordered list of goals. But when I think of human goals, they seem to be multiple and competing often. And I was wondering if you think that there's really a sort of, you know, a, this hierarchy that you can set up as a sort of ethical guide for. Um, you know, machines to behave ethically, or if there's the, you know, the, oftentimes with humans, the competition between their goals is kind of what makes them ethical. Yeah, that's a really great question. The whole seventh chapter in the book is all about goals, because I'm fascinated by your, by your question. And I, so I talk a lot there about the origin of human goals. Of course, originally for very simple life, the only goal that the, that the DNA had was to, for it to reproduce. And uh, then uh, the genes, through Darwinian evolution, gave us a brain to help them reproduce better and so on. And, uh, it, and it turned out there was just very inconvenient. Every time you had to decide whether to do this or that, if you had to like logically think back, if I eat this apple instead of this peanut here, which is gonna give me more offspring, you know, way too complicated. So it gave us these heuristic rules of thumb instead. Like, if, if you feel hunger, then eat. If you feel thirst, then drink, and, and so on. And that worked pretty well, but what that also means is that uh, we don't actually, we, can't, we humans can't actually be described by any simple mathematical goal function, just like, like you're saying here. Which means when, you, when, we, when we say things like, make sure the AI has our goals, we have, <laughs> it's a tough challenge to even make full sense of what exactly you mean by that. We also know how hard it is ourselves to reconcile sometimes if we look at our friends, come ask us for advice about life. Sometimes the goals they say they have aren't really borne out exactly in the choices they make, right? So a lot of fascinating work <laughs> to be done on, on goals. I think we only have time for one more question. All right. But those of you who didn't get to ask now, feel free to come chat with me afterwards at the book signing table. Hi. Uh, how would you communicate goals to a machine if they can't understand language or words or the meaning behind any words? Really good question. So first of all, I think um, in the more distant future, we will want, if we, really, if we really want smart machines to understand our goals, we will want them to be able to talk to us in our language so we can communicate with them easily. I, I, think, I think even in the shorter term, if, if you have a if a, if a retired person has a helper robot at home, you know, we can't expect them to become masters of, of uh, Keras, Python, uh, neural network programming or whatever, right? It, it, so it's, it's actually, there's a very interesting research field called inverse reinforcement learning, where the idea is machine tries from just looking at our behavior to infer what we really care about, right? Like if somebody's holding their baby and they drop their coffee cup and the machine notices that they let the coffee, coffee they only have, didn't have enough hands to catch both, they let the coffee cup fall and not the baby, that there's a lesson there, right? And uh, we humans, when we're babies, we actually learn a lot more about our parents' values and goals from what they s do than what they say. So that there's an interesting science there. But finally, I just want to end on an optimistic note here that even long before we can crack these problems of what to even mean by human goals and have machines learn very sophisticated goals, I don't think we should let perfect be the enemy of the good. Because there are a lot of goals that pretty much all humans agree on 
that are actually very interesting, easy to program into machines, which we haven't done yet. Like most industrial accidents are caused by machines, industrial robots, not even understanding the most rudimentary human values, like that a human is not an auto part and should not be smushed into the, some socket or something, right? And Boeing here does not under any circumstances want their airplanes to be flown into fixed objects, right? Yet, that's exactly what people were able to do on September 11. And much more recently, Andreas Lubitz, the press German pilot of the German Wings airline, was able to fly his passenger jet with hundreds of people into the Alps. And how did he do it? He asked the computer to do it. And it's like, okay. He just told the autopilot to go down to an altitude of 100 meters. Even though the computer had within it the whole map of the Alps GP and it had GPS and everything. So, so these, it's this sort of kindergarten ethics that there's universal, near universal agreement on. We should absolutely start programming it into our machines already whenever we can. So the machines start to at least understand these basic goals. That will already save lives and, and, and be a good stepping stone towards the more challenging goal alignment questions that lie beyond. So thank you so much again for all the wonderful questions. Thank you so much, Max Tegmark. Life 3.0 is available in the lobby right there from the wonderful Ada's technical books.